thank you for all the organizers for this possibility to give this talk. So, um, we go directly to the topic, so what is organic food? So, organic food is production which is under regulation of European Union, and it's only production system that is controlled. In Finland, it's controlled by EVRA, Peace Food Safety Authority. So what does it mean, shortly? It means that there are less pesticides, only few allowed, less fruit additives, 48 compared to conventional production, where it's over 3,000, uh, no synthetic chemicals, no antibiotics. And the question is, is organic food healthier than conventional food? What do you think about when you think about these aims? We, we aim that uh, organic food is healthy for humans, animals, plants, and environment. So what we know already, what is known, is there any research? In general, we can say there is not enough research conducted with organic food and its health effects. We need more research. We know already that there, in organic milk, the omega fatty acid uh, relationship is, is better than in conventional. We know already that in vegetables, in oats and barley, we have higher polyphenol contents, which are bioactive for our health. But there are several concerns that scientists want to know more with uh, research. Uh, harmful effect of pesticides to microbiome, uh, the multi-generation effects of the pesticides. There, there are several aspects. So how do we look the organic food? What we have to, to survey? So Carolus Trasnes from New State University told uh, into, in June, in our conference, organic conference, that it's more important to look the diet and the whole lifestyle, not the single compounds. So, it, European study, studies show that the people who prefer organic food also follow overall healthier diets. They eat more fruits and vegetables, more whole grains, and less meat. And in France and in Germany, National Nutrition Service include organic consumption data in the analysis. For example, in Germany, there was a positive relationship between healthy dietary patterns, nutrition knowledge, and a healthy lifestyle. So we should survey the whole lifestyle, not the individual components, but we also have to be very uh, intensive uh, look. We have to have intensive look for the pesticides and their harmful effects in future. Some example what is important food. It's uh, one important food is milk. And there's not much research available and it's, it would be interesting to know what is the difference between conventional and organic milk composition. The microbiome is very important for uh, human gut health. What is the microbial quality of the tank milk? <coughs> what we have in, in, we have, uh, in organic raw milk, we have a huge possibility for, for example, uh, products with allergies and their prevention. So, but there's a risk for biohazards. So probably we have to isolate and purify the compounds, not to use raw milk acid because of the risk of the, the contaminants. And there's uh, also, we need to look for novel processing technologies for organic food. Careful processing, it takes care of the palliative components and their preservation. We know that there are not, not many, um, not all the processing methods are not uh, allowed, but we have to find new as well. So when we think about the foods for the florists, what are they? So we have, uh, in Finland, we have everyone's right, and we can pick a lot of berries. These are so for biophenols, so polyphenols, and then we have the mushrooms for protein source. 
and we have wide herbs, culinary and medicinal use. And special products we can find. Resin, it is already in medicinal use, in Finland at least, sap, and we have taken mushroom, it has a huge health effect, strong antioxidant and tumor activity, anti-activity. So we aim to we aim to certify the Finnish forest. We have now certified for 40% of the Finnish forests are organic forests, and we are aiming to certify all the forests because then the use of the forest picking and collection products are are uh, delivered for more consumers. They have more commercial value, and they, because the label is uh, people. Uh, respect the organic label, so we can reach more people with more healthy products. This is a take on mushroom. So also we can, we can further go with the, with the forest products, we can cultivate the berries. We've already started to cultivate lingon berries, bilberries, cloud berries, and mushrooms. They can be cultivated to guarantee the constant delivery for commercial pur purposes. So I shall tell you about our own research. It's a uh, okay. And uh, so my research, our research group has diverted infectious diseases, and uh, we, we are fighting you know, against antimicrobial resistance. We know that it's global and it reaches everyone, every country, and it's it's comparable to climate change problems at the moment. New antibiotics are not available in the near future. So uh, there's a problem that the antibiotics do not treat those people who need them, actually, urgently. So one example is streptococcus pneumonia, which causes the death of million children every year. It's one of our research projects. <coughs> so we have natural alternatives in prevention and cure. We can use anti adhesion therapy using natural products like berries, berry polyphenols. We can use natural antibiotics like honey and other plant materials. We can fight against human pathogens, uh, respiratory infections, and several other bacterial strains, and also against animal pathogens. So, about the berries, I forgot to tell you that this one that uh, if we want to have the, the healthy effect of the berries, it is known it's very used in addition to this anti-infective effects. It has uh, effects on brain health, it has anti-aging effects, it has favorable impact on blood pressure and blood sugar and eye health, and uh, it's anti-cancer, it has an, they have anti-cancer activity, anti-inflammatory effects. But you, you have to, consume them about 100 grams a day. It's recommended to, to reach these health effects. So why shouldn't I eat berries? I think I, I would be quite stupid if I don't take them. So then I go to the infective, anti-infective uh, activities of our studies. So the bacterial adhesive is the, is the main, main start. So the bacteria, gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria, uh, it is to the host surface using in gram negative. They have this fimbrial, oh, sorry, fimbrial structure, uh, like hair like structure. In gram positive, uh, they have the surface proteins mostly attaching to the host surface and recognizing the cell surface receptor sugar structures. This interaction is very specific, and we try to prevent the adhesion using the berry compounds. Yes, once again. The from negative bacteria, this virus, virus structure is attaching to the host cell surface, recognizing this. Yes, this one matrix protein, recognizing the sugar structures. It can be also in this, along with the virus, some protein, for example, who is, which is recognizing the sugar. There are several interactions. So in, in antihistamine therapy, we can block these bacterial adhesion to host cells using the receptor analogs, the sugar analogs, or we can use also berry polyphenols. This has been shown already. This is the very original studies using the cranberry juice. Uh, 
E. coli causing urinary tract infections, recognizing galactose, alkalinefilm galactose, and adaptation to urinary tract can be prevented by using cranberry juice. This study has been carried out with American uh, uh, cranberry um, uh, vaccinium macrocarbon, and, and it has been uh, shown that this, this uh, adhesion can be really blocked by this this cranberry juice uh, pro anthocyanins There are a lot of studies carried out with these uh, juices. And uh, it's very unknown already that we can prevent <coughs> the current, uh, we can prevent the uh, infections using cranberry juice. We have uh, several products, dietary supplements, uh, for example, for these purposes. So usually it's associated to its active dimer A of the pro -anthocyanin. We have this, uh, this <coughs> active pro in cranberry, in lingonberries, and in bilberries as well. So we have studied uh, Finnish berries, wild berries, lingonberry, bilberry, cranberry. It's, it's cranberry is from the, the white cranberry, and cranberry and black currant. We had several bacteria. Nasalomingitidis, Streptococcus pneumoniae, group of oral bacteria strains, and Streptococcus biogenes. And some animal pathogens like pathogens like Streptococcus suis and Streptococcus agalactiae. And these are the, the favorite compounds of the berry. So <coughs> we know all that now already that this activity, what we have found from these berries, are totally associated to these anthocyanins or, or these uh, pro anthocyanins in these berries what we studied. But there are also some studies showing that electronics are active and there can be some other, other polyphenolic compounds from berries which are bioactive. <coughs> So we have analyzed the berry, berry fractions we have studied by using NMR, and we have purified the sucraxons uh, by HPLC and analyzed them. So we can see that they are anthocyanins and pro anthocyanins in these active fractions. I don't quote this true, but I just want to show that this is here, uh, these are here. When we find pro anthocyanins in the fractions, or purified subfractions or anthocyanins, the activity was associated to these fractions. And it was confirmed on several levels. In several methods, these were all in vitro, but they were confirmed. This is a cell uh, culture study using um, human uh, cell line, memorial uh, uh, cell line, functional cell line, and here we had uh, Cranberry juice tree, cranberry juice, which has reached already almost 100% prevention of the bacteria pneumox attachment to the cells. And also we had bilberries, bilberry juice, not so good, but anyhow, it had activity and cranberry juice here in the studies. So we can see that we can really prevent the bacteria local attachment to the human cells. And this was also confirmed to other bacteria the same. We found the same thing for meningococcus and uh, oral bacterial states that causes, that causes uh, dental caries, that we could prevent the binding or aggregation. And also, we found for these uh, cranberries, and bilberries and cranberries, that they, they had antibiotic acti activity as well. They killed the bacteria. They prevented the growth and killed them in high concentrations. There was no bacterial survival at all. So they, they also work as antibiotics. Okay, the next thing. This was the spot of those berries, so I recommend to everyone, use the berries 100 grams per day and be healthy, more healthy. And now, uh, so honey is under uh, huge uh, 
and intensive research. Uh, as such, from PubMed, I found now 2,067 uh, articles. And uh, in total, I'm uh, using the uh, words honey and antimicrobial, 1,300. So, because we have the antimicrobial resistance, so we need to find something else, and it's really recovered. Honey is recovered again. It's not so alternative, it's used already against the infections. So I had the, the pyramid from Egypt, so we have found the bee, but it has been found honey from the pyramids. It has been used for medicine for centuries. And honey gets its antimicrobial activity by various mechanisms. It, the main thing is that it has high sulfur concentration. It almost uh, a total sugar, about 80% mixture of fructose and, and glucose. It has low pH, about 3, and when it's diluted, it produces hydrogen peroxide, and which is, which is antibacterial. So we have also found there's methyl, methyl trioxal in manuka honey. Uh, it is very commercial used honey at the moment, sell with high prices. Sell, it is sold more than it's produced. So you may think about there may be some frauds as well. And then uh, in Reva milk from uh, uh, the Netherlands, they found a deficit one protein which is secreted by the bees. They have phenolics, and also they have all microbes. These all can work together, and then honey is <coughs> antimicrobial. So it's active against, it has been shown it's active against uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. We have done uh, three studies with honeys. We have shown Finnish monoflora study with honeys. They are active against them. Uh, Pneumococcus and Staphylococci, and uh, including uh, medicine resistant Staphylococcus aureus. <coughs> and we have also shown that these organic honeys have shown activity against food poisoning, Clostridium perfringi, which causes, uh, for example, uh, poultry uh, poisoning contamination. Here's the figure about this. This monofloral honeys. So we have here. If you look, uh, this is uh, this is uh, against the pneumonia. We have even 20, as low as 20 percent concentration. We have statistical uh, significant prevention of the bacterial growth. <coughs> the most active <coughs> active honeys were willow herb, heather, and buckwheat honeys. All, against all these bacteria, this is Stratobox pneumoniae. Here we have Stratobox pergenes. Here we have Staphylococcus aureus, and here is MRSA. So also activity against uh, MRSA. So we think we can think about, for example, wound infections against wound infections uh, when, uh, in surgeries. Uh, there are problems. Uh, the wood in, in uh, recovering, so we can use honey against this when the antibiotics do not work anymore. Thank you. So this is an African study I wanted to show you because here you see the colors. So here are the uh, honeys are from Finland. They are organic, but they have we have studied against uh, 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 Kenyan pathogens that causes uh, DRA, for example. So you see the colors, and you think about the colors are important because even if you have the dark color in the honey, it contains phenolic compounds, certainly, and it should be active. So we think about, here we see this uh, F and E and D, okay, F is very strong. Was it active then? So, if you see here, there are the bacteria strains, E. coli, Salmonella, Pseudomonas, Aeroponosa, Klebsiola, Pneumonia, Bacillus, Cereus, Tablopus, Epidermidis. So, we can see that <coughs> honey, if it's 
was the dark one, was the most active. This minimal inhibitor concentration was so low, 12.5. Two, two uh, of these honeys were not active at all. One was, of these was conventionally produced, the one was uh, organic. The reason we don't know, it may be it may be that these honeys have been treated by heating, heating so the bioactivity is disappeared. But, but four of these honeys were active, and two were inactive. And we think about this, uh, we, can, we hope that we can get also results with the African honeys, uh, which has been until now negative, and we may think about that it Great results from the frogs that they are not, they are fake honeys, which is very, uh, very uh, actively carried out nowadays to get a very good price for the sugar. So this is one of the we have used several methods for this honey in honey research. This is this uh, diffusion method, and you see, see that the. The zone of inhibition for against E. coli is clear ring there with the honeys. So we have also used other methods, microplus dilution method. Okay, so we can use honeys, we hope we can use them in vivo in order to control infections caused, uh, caused by the studied pathogens. Oh, uh, in general, the applications of our berries and honeys what we have studied. <coughs> so, I think that we can use them as them they are. We can have berry juices, we can have dried berries, and but we can take them as them. We, you need not to do anything, and it, it's cheap for everyone, and everyone can use this and to prevent the diseases and keep your healthy. To pre prevent after your flu. You can prevent perhaps your your uh, respiratory infections caused by bacteria like pneumococcus. So no otitis media and no sinusitis, no pneumonia. So it may help a lot. But in honey, we, when we use honey, we must re remember that we can't keep it under children under one year old. So, but this is this is just just them you can use. Of course, we can use also as preservatives uh, in food products. So there are a lot of people who have who have participated in these studies and want to thank everyone. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. Uh, I'm sure it stimulates questions. Please. Uh, thank you. I'm interested to know, uh, do you have any knowledge about uh, the effect of honey against a biofilm? Because in clinical medicine, biofilm plays a very big role. Can they disrupt the reformed biofilm? Thank you. Uh, there, are, there are some studies uh, that I think they are in nasoferous area. They have uh, used against biofilms, against Staphylococcus aureus. I would like to say to mention that there's a, a Finnish uh, research also done uh, with honey. Uh, which is so-called probiotic honey, which has never been uh, heated over 35 degrees. And this honey, uh, according to my institute, have been studied to contain at least seven different microbial strains. Uh, in Sweden, they have studied uh, respectively um, organic honey to contain at least 15 different microbial strains. And in Finland, we have over 3,000 people who have been permanently um, tolerated against their uh, pollen allergies in combination to that they don't uh, they also um, got rid of their uh, uh, various cross-reacting uh, food allergen allergies so this is a, a dramatic result and uh, um, it is pity that the um, 
producer, one single elderly man uh, from Eastern Finland, uh, cannot survive with his honey because people, once they uh, are treated with the honey over one or three seasons during the winter, get recovered so well that they don't need to use the honey anymore. When you compare this to the other probiotic products that are on the market, people need to uh, be hooked for those products. But this is a permanent result by the honey. So, so I'm a little, not confused, but at what point does the dilution of the honey lead to the sugar causing increases in possibly um, <coughs> harmful bacteria, etc., or the other parts of the microbiome increasing? So I mean, what you're doing also is feeding the bacteria with the sugar. So. At what point does the sugar, you know, in the dilution process, at what point does the sugar effect overwhelm the other, or does that never happen? So, so we have used these dilutions, and uh, it worked. Uh, I, I, I can't, I can't. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Karina, for joining us today and this interesting results. So to continue what Diane just said, I was about to ask if, uh, as we get, uh, when we get flu, when we are children, at least when I was a child, my mother used to give either blackcurrant drink or honey water, <coughs> warm or hot. So are these flavonoid compounds and other substances uh, that might be there in honey to protect the respiratory tract. Are they uh, sort of uh, alive in the heated drink or what, what's your advice? Uh, do you mean that do we, uh, do we have to heat or do we uh, have to Should we avoid heating? Yeah, it's uh, there are ma many opinions about that. And uh, Actually, in Russia, they have done some research, and they recommend that uh, you should not heat it over 40 degrees if you want to have the bioactive comp uh, components working. So, but uh, for example, the thing is, beekeepers uh, say that uh, you can use it in, in tea normally. It's not so hot, and it does not uh, affect uh, to this bioactive. But if you want to be sure, if you got the flu, and you want to be sure that it, now it has to work. Don't heat it after uh, over 40 degrees. So and and then it has to be taken a bit more. Um, usually. Thank you. There was some other question. So thank you very much for this fascinating talk. Uh, so uh, do you have personally some uh, idea? How much these products, these natural uh, antibacterial products, could reduce the need of the antibiotics? Uh, some some kind of uh, idea, a practical point where, where this could lead us. It's a difficult question, really. Of course, of course it is. Yeah, it's really so, so. We have to continue the research, and what I think it's it's important that uh, locally we should find the the components, the plants, which are active. In, this, in, in Kenya, we have to find Kenyan honeys, and we have already studied some, some tree uh, stem bark extract against malaria. And we have to continue this research and, and use them locally. And I think it's, it's quite much used already in developing countries. The natural, natural uh, products are uh, preferred instead of uh, of synthetic uh, drugs. So, but we need them, we need antibiotics as well. That's true, that's for sure. Okay, uh, uh, thanks. Uh, is it uh, possible to uh, know what's the economical status of the uh, people who use more berries? Are they more money in general? And uh, do they have also better computers? 
So the berries, actually when he, uh, about the berries, I'm not sure, but if you think about the organic food, so the European studies show that uh, people who are, uh, there are other sorts of us who are using organic food. I think it's also this, this um, they use more berries as well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if there are no more questions, we thank you once more.